I'm going to start while everybody else uh, takes a minute to sit down, or maybe it's actually cooler over there, and that's the way that, while they're standing. Um, I'm John DeWolf. Um, I'm the new senior vice president for Howard Hughes here in Columbia, based here in Columbia. Thank you. That applause came before the fact that I'm going to take full responsibility for the air conditioning. I, I apologize for that. Um, I have notes from Barb Nichols, who basically runs my life. Um, I'm going to acknowledge the following elected officials who are here, um, and we thank them for um, being here. Guy Gazone, Jen Terraza, um, Courtney Watson, Mary Case Sigeti. Um, thank you. Um, I get to, I have a um, very brief role. I get to introduce the person who's going to introduce the speaker tonight. Um, um, let me just take a quick second to do a little uh, commercial for Howard Hughes. We're, <clears throat> this is my 23rd day in the job. I'm going to start counting weeks pretty soon. Um, Howard Hughes is um, in and of itself only six months old, um, a brand new company uh, that, that as I'm sure you all know, uh, was spun off this fall from uh, General Growth. Um, it's a wholly independent uh, company. It's uh, traded under the symbol HHC on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, it's, um, although I'm probably violating a whole bunch of securities laws, the, the stock itself has been uh, very successful. We, in, in, in and of ourselves, have a market cap of over $3 billion and just a really um, we're off to a great start. We think we have a bright future. This is a key piece of that future. Um, and we're very intent on um, seeing that to a, to a very good future. Uh, the, uh, as Chris, the speaker tonight, will talk about, uh, we do, though, start off in, in a rapidly changing um, real estate world, uh, a world that in my 30 years of being in the business is um, changing more so in the last year or two than I've seen it change over those 30 years. Um, and we're coming out of a recession that as general growth really exemplified uh, was started by the real estate business. Um, we're, we're slowly coming out of it, but we are still coming out of it. Um, good projects though can be recognized today. You, you can find funding, you can actually accomplish good projects, but those projects need to be set in the context of this really changing world. Um, Phil Nelson uh, gave me Chris's book and I, I read it. I'm living over in the Sheraton now, so I didn't have anything better to do last night. Um, uh, and read actually right through the book, I, I thought the, one of the best lines was, we're leaving the age of Leave it to Beaver and entering the age of Seinfeld. Uh, um, and, it, and you know, there, there may be a reason desperate housewives are desperate. It's, it, it's, all of these things are changing. And, and I think this talk will be very timely tonight because he's, gonna, he's going to center on that. Um, um, let me, Phil gave me another book. And I'm, I thought I was gonna have a podium, so now I'm gonna reach for my piece of paper. Um, and this is a, when, when you're in the business that I was in, that I am in, um, you, James Rouse is somebody that you wanted to grow up to be. He, it, this, this is a place that um, I used to come two or three times a year. Um, and uh, uh, along with being a visionary person, the people that worked for him and were the Rouse company were very difficult business people. <laughs> you came here and really kissed the ring. But I found, um, <laughs> I found this quote, which I thought was actually fabulous. Uh, people are ready and waiting to do the job that is necessary to make their communities work. People are drawn by logic and reason and by a deep yearning for order, beauty, and a good life. They will rise to big, dramatically good plans, and they will yawn at timid, uh, the cautious, and the unconvincing. And, and I think that just sets tonight up. I think that's what, what needs to come next in, in the real estate world and in Columbia. Um, I think uh, what's going to be good for all of that is Howard Hughes is well positioned to do that. Um, turn the mic over to Phil. Good evening and thank you for coming. I'm Phil Nelson, I'm the president of CA. And one of the things that kind of impressed me when John was introduced to me is they said, well, he's very quiet like you, 
they, both of you say about 50 words a day, and with that I've almost used my limit. <laughs> but one of the things I also want to say, for those of you who've seen the new advertising campaign for CA, no, I will not be visiting a pool near you. <laughs> <laughs> it takes way too much water to replace what I would displace, so. In preparing for, this, for the notes tonight, uh, I did a little research on the timing of what took place in Columbia at the time that James Rouse and his company started this, this community. And at that time, gasoline was 23 cents a gallon, uh, oil was plentiful, uh, most of the neighborhoods were uh, brought up in the, in the term of nuclear family, which means mother, father, and kids. And when you compare it with today, as you know, gasoline is $4 a gallon. There's a possibility of going even higher uh, based on the supply and the, and the world situation. Uh, it just seems like there's going to be another realm of change. The nuclear family is being replaced. Uh, in Baltimore and Washington, D.C., 8% of the family structures are nuclear family. So you can see there's going to be a lot of different head of household and different household makeups. When Columbia started, the median age was about 11, and now it's 39. So there are going to be so many changes that are coming forth, and this is one of the reasons why we've started this speaker series, is to try to get input based on the speeches we have, but get your feedback on what needs to take place, not only for uh, Howard Hughes Corporation, but for CA as well. We're very interested in the changes that we're going to have to meet, uh, or to make to meet the future. And with that, I'd like to uh, give you a little bit of background on Chris Leinberger. I had the privilege of being a part of a study they did when I was city manager in Troy, Michigan. Uh, Chris did a walkability analysis. At U of M students and Urban Land Institute teamed together to do a, a walkability analysis for a, a portion of Troy. And so far, it's right on point of all the different things that are projected for change. And anybody that's from Michigan knows that we don't believe in buses, we don't believe in trains or trolleys, we believe in cars. And those things are going to change in Michigan as well. But to give you a little background on Chris, he's a professor, a researcher, an author. He's also been a developer. He's a visiting fellow at the Brookings Institute. He's a professor and founding director of the Graduate Real Estate Development Program at the University of Michigan. He's a nationally recognized expert in real estate and development trends and he's a much under, honored proponent of livable communities. And with that, uh, before I introduce him, there are pieces of paper and pencils on your uh, chairs. And if you have a question, write that question down and pass them to the aisles. They'll be picked up, and then uh, Chris will answer those questions at the end of the presentation. But with that, I'd like to introduce Chris Leinberger. It is so good to be here because, for the same reason, Jim Rouse is um, one of the heroes of almost all of us that are in this business. And I've uh, worked with him over the years, not extensively, but I'm currently on the real estate board of the Enterprise uh, Community uh, Partners. We have our board meeting actually next week down in D.C. We meet in a different city each time. And uh, Bart Harvey, many of you I'm sure know Bart, and his wife Janet Marie Smith, um, old, old friends of mine. I've also been involved with Baltimore for decades. I used to be on the board of uh, Nottingham Properties. That was up in Towson. They did White Marsh. Uh, and, I've been, and I grew up in Philadelphia, so, and I now live in, in D.C., so I know this town extremely well. I also know your movies, so I know how quirky Baltimore is. Keep it up with John Walters and all the rest. Um, it is, my wife and I love to come up to some of, your, some of the strangest museums on the East Coast. Um, but, you know, the thing about Jim is, was that he was always so far in front of the rest of the world. And it started back in the 50s when he and, uh, he and uh, maybe Al Taubman uh, basically invented regional malls. He was 10 to 20 years in front. Then, of course, with the Newtown movement in the 60s, he was in front with that, and he succeeded, unlike almost every other Newtown that failed. Um, but he invented the master plan community, basically. 
And so that was in the 60s. That took off in the 70s and 80s as far as a market trend throughout the rest of the country. Of course, urban festival uh, markets that uh, he introduced, of course, back in the 70s. And I, I always remember, uh, there was a great architect out in Los Angeles named John Jurdy, and Jim, John and I were having a drink a number of years ago, and after a few drinks, uh, John Jurdy, the architect, says, so Jim, tell me, you uh, put up a 40,000 square foot fruit stand in the harbor in Baltimore and 12 million people showed up. How'd you do that? <laughs> um, but he was back in the 70s reintroducing a concept that I'm gonna be talking about tonight. He basically is the first develop, mainstream developer in this country to understand what I'm gonna be talking about 30 years later, which we in, the, we in real estate are just barely beginning to comprehend, which is what I refer to, a lot of us refer to as walkable urbanism. And then of course, with enterprise, he really demonstrated that we are on this planet for a short time and you have to give back. And he gave back with Enterprise in a major, major way, setting a, a, a tone for this industry as far as dealing with the, what is now even a, a more severe problem is affordable housing. So what I wanna talk about is, just as you've heard now from, from uh, John, is this phenomenal structural change in how we build the built environment. The market is telling us they want something different and quite honestly, what Colombia is today. Because to a certain extent, Colombia is the same Colombia I knew when I first got to know it 25 years ago. It's pretty much gone flatline over the last 20, 30 years. And, but the market wants something different. And I really, I truly believe that just as Jim Rouse understood walkable urbanism back in the 70s and in the 80s when none of us knew what that meant, there he was on the cover of Time Magazine saying cities are fun. What he was saying was walkable urbanism is fun, whether it be in the city or in the suburbs. And he knew that then, and we're only catching up to him now. First, so what are we talking about as far as this built environment, this term that we policy wonks like to toss out? The built environment is your home, this building, the road in front of us, the metro system, sewer lines, anything that allows us to live, work, and play in this environment. And it's a mere 35% of the asset base of the country. It's the largest asset class in the entire economy. If you took all the New York Stock Exchange companies and took all the NASDAQ company, took their capitalized value and doubled them, the built environment's larger. And we in real estate are, are particularly proud of that because we know that we've cratered this economy twice out of the last three downturns. We're, we did it. And the, but the other thing is, is that why this economy right now is stuck at 1.82% growth and we're being lapped by the rest of the world, not Europe, but we're being lapped by India, China, even parts of Africa is because this 35% of the asset base of the economy is on the sidelines. And it's on the sidelines because the market wants something different than what we know how to build. They haven't learned the lesson of Jim Rouse. The other thing about the built environment is that it affects so many other things. And if you're concerned about energy consumption, if you're concerned about the fact that we used to, you know, 30, 40 years ago when this place was founded, we were the largest oil producer on the planet. Today, we are, of course, absorb we are importing over 60% of the oil we use, mostly to regimes that don't like us very much and are obviously charging us $100 per barrel and would love it to be at 150 or 200 bucks a barrel. Um, that the energy consumption and the greenhouse gas emissions is directly related to the built environment that the buildings that we occupy, and if we could cool this off more, we would even use more energy and more coal and more oil. Um, but the buildings we occupy uh, use 40% of our energy and emit a little over 40% of greenhouse gas emissions. 
our transportation system that we use to get between our buildings uses over 30%. So over 70% of our energy consumption and of our greenhouse gas emissions come out of the built environment. And if ever we get serious about energy independence or about climate change, the built environment is first in line as far as how to deal with it. Other thing to note is, just as sort of background, is that there's 15 infrastructure categories, but first among equal is transportation. Transportation drives development. That's why we, here in the state, you have a, um, you have a secretary of transportation, you don't have a secretary of sewage because transportation is a very important, uh, it's the most important infrastructure. And to modify a famous Winston Churchill quote, we first build our transportation system and then it molds our metro regions. So if we just invest in one kind of transportation system, that, like we've done over the last 50, 60 years, which is roads, where 85, 90% of our transportation dollars have gone, we're gonna build one kind of built environment what is referred to as drivable suburban. You all know drivable suburban because Columbia is one of the finest examples of drivable suburban in the country. It has really perfected the drivable suburban model. The other option is if you put in a multitude of different transportation modes. Cars, of course, very important. I like my car very much, thank you very much. Um, but rail transit, bus transit, biking, very important, but at its base, it's walkable. Once you get to a place, you can then build what's known as walkable urban. And these two ways are the only two broad ways of building the built environment. And now there's lots of variations between, you know, within those two broad ways, but that's it. For the 6,000 years that we've been building cities as civilization, that we would only build, generally we built walkable urban. The last 50, 60 years, we introduced this brand new concept known as drivable suburban. And as I say, Columbia, particularly on the East Coast, Columbia is the finest example of drivable suburban. It's important also to understand though that, that how we build the built environment is also a reflection of the underlying economy. You gotta make a buck. You've, as Jim Rouse said in his, five, in his list of five things that you must do when you build a community, number five was you gotta make a dollar, you gotta make a living. And how we build the built environment directly relates to the underlying economy. And therefore, it, it, it relates to what we've always referred to in this country as the American dream. Because we've had different American dreams over the last 300 years. That the first American dream was built upon the agricultural economy. 200 years ago, 92% of us were farmers. And the first American dream is best encapsulated by that Civil War phrase, 40 acres and a mule. If you had 40 acres and a mule, you could live the American dream. Fast forward to the industrial age in, in the 20th century, peaked about 1970 is when the, was the peak of the industrial age, that the American dream changed. And one of the things you may not recognize is that back in 1970, back in the mid part of the, uh, of the last century, 40% of all jobs directly and indirectly were related to providing the raw material for assemblage, the fueling of, the financing of, the servicing, sales, maintenance, insuring, and building the roads for the automobile. So the second American dream became what Columbia was built upon, drivable suburban, low density, separation of land uses, and virtually every trip that was utilitarian from your house was made by the car. So as you were seeing the USA in your Chevrolet, you were making yourself wealthier. It made, made perfect sense. So back after the Second World War, we in this country took that pendulum where we, we in the built environment back in the 20s and the turn of the last century, we were building walkable urban places. After the Second World War, we pushed that pendulum all the way over to this brand new world, the brave new world of drivable suburban. 
And as I say, Columbia is sort of the pinnacle of that. And now, this will demonstrate, since I'm at Brookings, I want to just demonstrate the depth of my scholarly research. Um, this, this is definitive proof about how we build the built environment. I love the popular films that really use the built environment as a character in the film. And the 1985 classic, Back to the Future, is the only film that shows the two ways of building the built environment in the same film. So this first clip is when um, Martin J. F uh, when um, uh, Martin Fox goes back to 1955 to the town that he was eventually born in called Hill Valley. By the way, the Hollywood writers who made up this fictitious town borrowed a, uh, a trick that we in real estate use about how to name things. Hill Valley was, again, a fictional town. And how we name things is that we name it after what we destroy to build it. <laughs> so they took the hill, pushed it into the valley, and built Hill Valley. Um, this is the downtown of Hill Valley in 1955, but it was really built in, if, if this was a real town, back in the 20s. And this is how life was lived by our grandparents and great-grandparents. And so it was the center of town life. You, you could get around by walking or by car, by bike, by bus, or in the case of Michael J. Fox, by skateboard. And it was an entirely different way of living. Pretty idyllic. But, but even then, the seeds of change had been planted for the future drivable suburban world. This, again, you probably haven't watched this movie 20, 30 times like I have, so you probably didn't pick this up. But this is the billboard that he put the, uh, he put the a DeLorean behind when he, comes, when he goes back to 1955 Hill Valley. This billboard is advertising his subdivision that he was born in. So going to 1985, back to when he was a teenager, here's downtown Hill Valley, X-rated movie theaters, homeless on the street. The town square is now a parking lot. Oh, Brett. It was great. Everything looks great. 124. I still got time. So now he goes out to the new town square, which is naturally the regional mall. And it's like every other regional mall, like your regional mall here, it's a bunch of big boxes surrounded by asphalt. Uh, by the way, check out what it's named uh, after. And, and also, what happened in this clip that never happens in real life, I'm sure it never happens at your mall here. So the lone pine tree was torn down, was, was bulldozed to build the mall. And what happened here that never happens in any mall is that that access road, you would never go down on foot. So you can see these two ways of building the built environment, high density, mixed use, walkable urban versus low density, single purpose use, car driven. Two viable ways and two ways that there's a market for but it's just two different ways of building the built environment. And of course, after the Second World War, we began to put in the freeways to allow the drivable suburban future to happen. This is uh, King of Prussia outside of Philadelphia, which is where I grew up. And here's King of Prussia Mall uh, when it was first built, one of the first malls on the East Coast as well. When I first went here from my walkable urban 1920s uh, uh, town, I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I thought it was great that you drive here on big freeways. It was just great. And of course, we've only gotten better at building freeways. This is in Dallas. And of course, the commercial strips and the, and, and the growth of our metropolitan area has just continued to push further and further out. 
And by the way, this did not just reflect market demand. It also reflected public policy that we put in place. We put in place extensive public policy, which included laws that, that mandated that you only build drivable suburban and massive subsidies that, continu that uh, continue to this day. And it's because we wanted it. Our elected officials responded to the market demand of the 60s, 70s, and 80s for more and more low-density development. So how it laid out on the ground is, is reflected in this little uh, model here. Um, if you know three things about any metropolitan area, you know where most growth has gone. And I'm going to do a little sidebar here that Columbia is a real exception to the rule, and I'll come back to that later on. But any metropolitan area in the country, if you know where the white upper middle income housing concentration is, and I've got that in the center, where, where most of the executive housing tends to cluster, 70, 80, 90% of it tends to cluster in one area. If you know where the local minority housing tends to co concentrate, tends to be on the other side of town. And if you know where the freeways were put in, the, the black lines, which was a political decision, you know where the favored quarter is, the favored 90 degree arc coming out of downtown. And of course, the favored quarter in Washington goes to the Northwest. In Philadelphia, it goes to the Northwest. In Atlanta, it goes to the North. In Kansas City, it goes to the South. In Phoenix, it goes to the Northeast. In Seattle, it goes to the East. Now that shows how, that's how, uh, you know, you also have to consider topography because they couldn't go to the West unless they would want to swim all the time. Um, but in Baltimore, the favorite quarter is to the north. And, and again, I'll come back to Columbia because it is a truly, not only have you been the best master plan community on the East Coast, you've also been the great exception to the rule. And we'll come back to that. But when you take a look at this growth pattern out to the favored quarter, in the favored quarter, that's where 70, 80, 90% of all job growth went over 50, 60 years. And as a result, every 1% population growth, we would see anywhere from 4 to 8% land use consumption, otherwise known as sprawl. Now, of course, we in this country have no shortage of land. We in Canada and Australia, we are blessed. We stole the land fair and square, and <laughs> we use it, throw it away, and move on. That's part of our ethic. And um, as a result, we've seen these tremendously expanding metropolitan regions. But there's a downside to all this, and we're only just now beginning to understand it. This is some work done from a friend of mine in Chicago. He has a great think tank called the Center for Neighborhood Technology. This shows the CO2 emissions per household in the Chicago metropolitan region. And here, with my cursor, this is the city of Chicago. And here are the fringe communities out 30 and 40 miles south, west, and north of the loop. And by the way, um, CO2 and energy usage pretty much correlate one to one. So this could also be energy consumption per household. The color coding is that the orange is five times greater than the blue that, in essence, drivable suburban fringe is where the vast majority of CO2 and energy consumption takes place in our country. We did not know this five and ten years ago. This is brand new, uh, brand new research. The other thing we, we have just discovered, and what brought down this economy due to the mortgage collapse, is what happened to, you know, where did the mortgages collapse? Unfortunately, Treasury and FHA and Fannie and Freddie don't yet get this. That in this chart, again, by the, by the Center for Neighborhood Technology, different color code, that here again is the city of Chicago. The light colors are the fewest mortgage foreclosures. The, the, the blue is the most mortgage foreclosures. The mortgage foreclosures in this country was on the drivable suburban fringe. And it was really in the drive until you qualify housing districts that, in essence, sprawl 
brought down this economy. And it's going to cost us hundreds of billions of dollars to pay this off, money that we borrowed from the Chinese. So now we've got a new economy. We're in the knowledge economy. And it's my own uh, feeling, and a lot of other economists believe this as well, that the next economy beyond the knowledge economy is what's referred to as the experience economy. And naturally, when you change the economic base, what else changes? The American dream changes. So my own sense is that the third version of the American dream, which is being developed as we speak, is the option of either drivable suburban um, or walkable urban. The market wants both. However, we've overbuilt drivable suburban, and we have a great amount of pent-up demand for walkable urban. So what we've begun to see somewhere in the mid-90s, we began to see that that pendulum began to swing back as we saw our downtowns revive, as, we saw, as we've seen our town centers in the suburbs come back, like Bethesda, like Silver Spring. This is a reaction to pent up market demand for walkable urban product. This is the beginning of another major structural shift in, in how we build the built environment and, how we, uh, and, 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 uh, and what the market's demanding. Unfortunately, the public policy makes it illegal and we're subsidizing the opposite. Now, what are the reasons for it from, from a market point of view? And I know who's to blame. It's the damn kids. <laughs> we can absolutely blame, since most of you are baby boomers, uh, we can blame our kids. It's their fault. It's really the millennials, and it's really best seen, of course, on TV. Um, television and Hollywood does more consumer research than any other industry. Um, and so let's go back to see what, what we were raised on. This is, I mean, I could have shown lots of different clips, but here is I Love Lucy, third week in January, 1957. And in these clips, Lucy's thinking about leaving Manhattan to go out to the suburbs. And the, the reasoning may sound familiar to you. It's great for their child, fresh air, and she didn't mention a Jeffersonian ideal, but it's this back to the earth kind of ideal that so permeates America. Oh, Ethel, there's nothing like living in the country. Clean, fresh air, homegrown food. Lucy, you're not thinking of moving, are you? Why not? It'd be great for little Ricky. <gasps> and Grace took us to see the most wonderful house that's for sale. A quaint old early American. This clip, she's having second thoughts, looking out over her view of the back lot of Universal Studios. <laughs> well, here we are. No more tears, honey? Oh, no, I'm fine now that we're here. Gee, isn't this exciting? We're in our very own home. The first house we ever had. Now, the mistake that Lucy made here is that they, the, the next um, show, they invited Fred and Ethel out to visit. And two shows later, Fred and Ethel moved out to the suburbs of Connecticut as well, and they stupidly told their friends what a great place it was, and their friends moved out, and thus started the process. And the problem is, something we didn't know when we started this great social experiment called the suburbs, is that as you build more, the quality of life gets reduced. More is less. Because of traffic, because the open space is chewed up, because of pollution. And we didn't realize this at the beginning, but it's, but it's also a reason why we've seen the greatest democratic movement in our history, or over the last generation, take place. Neighborhood groups. When most of us were growing up, there were no neighborhood groups. There were PTAs, there were church groups, um, but there were no neighborhood groups. Now virtually every neighborhood in this country 
is organized, and they're organized to start to uh, stop real estate developers because of the more is less principle of drivable suburban development, which then just pushes development further and further out. Now look at what our kids were raised on. And again, I could have picked five different shows, but as John mentioned, Seinfeld always is a good one to start with. Here shows a, one of the most important sociological trends of our time is that those damn kids are delaying getting married, delaying having children. They've created a whole new age category, young adults. The baby boomers invented teenagers. They invented young adults in their 20s and early 30s, uh, postponing much of, uh, uh, of the real world and enjoying a walkable urban existence. So here are single friends strolling safely down a lively urban street. they move where they do the interview on Jeopardy now? Yeah, it used to be right in the middle of Single Jeopardy. Now they do it right after Single Jeopardy. Yeah, it's much better, isn't it? Oh, no comparison. The only show about nothing. But all of a sudden, this is a different image of how to live your life. And the market bought it. And the, and, and the consumer research that Hollywood did picked that up. Just as they picked up Lucy's. You know, back in 1957, very few people lived in the suburbs, but all the, move, but all the shows moved to the suburbs well before the market did. That was, the, that was the consumer research they picked up. Well, they did the same thing with Seinfeld, Friends, Sex and the City, showing a different way of living than how our kids were raised. So there's other reasons, though, besides our kids. We can't put all the blame on them. It's us, too, as baby boomers, those of us that are baby boomers, that we become empty nesters and we're soon retiring. Um, and we tend to downsize when we retire, and many, most of us want to live in the same neighborhood if we have that option. This, the other reason, though, is pure demographics. That, and this was alluded to before, that back in the 50s, 50% 50 of all households in this country had children living in them. 50% were singles and couples. Today, on average, and the numbers that Phil mentioned were, of course, a uh, rarefied to uh, metro regions, but throughout the country as a whole, only 25% of all households have children living in them. 75% are singles and couples. Now, the market for, for, for walkable urbanism is certainly targeting singles and couples, but it's not as if families aren't welcome as the Cadillac strollers in Georgetown, close to where I live, go down the sidewalk and you get thrown off the uh, sidewalk. Uh, but the same thing, the baby boom is taking place in Lincoln Park in Chicago in the Upper West Side in New York as families are raising their kids in the city. But the big thing is what's going to happen in the future. When you look at the marginal growth in households, what's going to be added on top of this 75-25 split? The growth in households over, over the next 20 years only 14% will have children within those households. 86% will be singles and couples. The market's telling us something. And then finally, there's just sheer boredom. Over the last 20, 30 years here in Baltimore, except for the last 10 years with the Inner Harbor and Fells Point and a few other places, over the last 20, 30 years, if you were moving to Baltimore and you wanted to buy a home, you could buy a single family home or a single family home, your choice. There really was no choice. The market's demanding a choice and it's bored if you're only offering them one thing. But most importantly, the creative class, those folks that are driving the knowledge economy want a walkable urban environment. That's what they're demanding. And if you don't offer it, those economic drivers are going someplace else. But then finally, it comes down to sheer economics, the expense of maintaining a fleet of cars to participate in a drivable suburban world. This is a um, uh, looking at the, the ways uh, that the average household spends its money. The middle pie chart looks at the average US household and demonstrates that n about 19% of their total household income is going towards transportation. Almost all of that is going towards maintaining cars. 
If you take a look on the right at a drivable suburban household, on average, 25% of their household income is going to maintaining a fleet of cars. It's the second highest category of household spending. We in real estate thought that Detroit was our friend. We now learn that Detroit is eating our lunch, that they're absorbing an ever-increasing share of household spending. And it's going into a depreciable asset. It's not a great way to build household wealth. Now look on the left, and you'll see that a walkable urban household, on average, only spends 9% of their household income on transportation. If you drop one car out of your household, the AAA tells us that it costs you $9,200 per year to own and maintain and service the debt on a Camry that you drive 15,000 miles per year. If you drop that car out of your household, you can increase your mortgage capacity by over $100,000. That's what we need to do if we want to build household wealth. There's been also some consumer research and market research that's tried to quantify what got us in this hole as far as, the, as far as this mortgage crisis? What got this economy in this ditch? And it goes to the fact that we overbuilt large lot single family housing. Here is the supply and demand of different kinds of housing types. There's 112 million households in this country. And about a little less than a quarter of them are attached. They're flats, they're condos. About 6% of them are townhouses. And then the rest are single family, divided a few small lot, but the bulk of them, large lot single family. If you look at the current demand, we have overproduced 37 million large lot single family houses in this country. We don't need to build another large lot single family home for the next generation. Um, and all the pent up demand is in townhouses and small lot single family homes. And there'll also be growth over time as far as attached housing. So this is how it plays out on the ground. Here is two houses close to here. The one on the left is a McMansion in Great Falls, Virginia. Uh, it's uh, why I picked Great Falls is A, because my brother lives there and I can rub his nose in this. <laughs> and B, because um, it was the highest sales per square foot in January of 2000. In the Washington region, you paid the highest sales per square foot to live in Great Falls, which made sense. You get generally a two acre lot, you get a big brand new house, and um, you have the schools that are among the best in the country. You would pay in, in January of 2000, 25% more on a price per square foot basis than that townhouse in DuPont Circle. And for that, you would get a lot that was a massive 1,600 square feet. And you would, that's a lot, that's not the house. The lot is 1,600 square feet. And you would send your kids to the worst schools in the country. Well, now let's look at January of 2010. That townhouse is worth 70% more on a price per square foot basis than that large lot single family. The lines crossed in the decade. In most markets in this country, the lines cross. The most expensive housing in this country today is walkable urban housing. The last time the lines crossed was probably back in the 60s and they were going the opposite direction. So what we have in our metropolitan regions is a tale of, is a tale of three cities. The, the uh, green line right here is, and this is looking at Metro Washington, here is the, the sales per square foot average prices in 2000 versus the peak in 2005 and then a one-third decline to 2010. That was the Metro average. The red line are the luxury drivable suburban places like Great Falls or Potomac. Or, or a McLean. They started higher, but they went up pretty much the same as the average price, and then they went down about the same as the average price. 
But take a look at the black line, which is the walkable urban places. They went up far faster. And then they went down about 15%. Today, 18 months later, they're pretty much back up to the, pre uh, to the previous peak. And, but where was the crash? The crash was at the bottom here, at the drivable suburban fringe, where the drivable suburban fringe went up less than the average, but then lost 50 to 60% of their market value. That was where the market crash was. That was why the Great Recession happened. And we're obviously in the, we're back down into a double dip housing downturn. So those numbers are even lower today. So the market wants walkable urban places. The question is how to create them. Because I'll tell you, they're a bitch to do. They are really hard. That we in real estate, um, we got really good at, I mean, the best uh, uh, way that I can think of it is that we got really good at driving NASCARs. NASCARs, you drive straight or turn left. Ironically, you never turn right. You can only turn left with a NASCAR. They're engineered that way. Uh, and go 150, 180 miles per hour. We now have to learn how to fly jet engines or uh, jet planes, where you go straight, turn right, turn left, go up 60,000 feet, or crash and burn in seconds going 600 miles an hour. It's a fundamentally different skill set, much more complex, much more risky. You must have a strategy in place, and it must be managed, and you here have one of the most exceptional management organizations, thank you Jim Rouse, that has ever been put in place in the country. And it's got, by the way, one of the largest budgets of any management organization in the country. The thing is about walkable urban places that we've just begun to learn over the last 10, 15 years is that as you add more energy, more products, more complexity, it just gets better. More is better. And it's all within a very tightly confined area. It's going to be no more than 400 acres, because that's what walkability is. If you go back to your high school geometry, pi r squared, people only want to walk about 1,500, 2,500 feet. And you, and you run your math, it's only 100, 200, 400 acres at most is what these walkable urban places are. But as you add the next restaurant, as you add the next apartment building, as you add the next hotel, you put more people on the street, it's safer, there's more energy, there's more people watching going on, it just gets better, land values go up, property taxes go up. And so we start this upward spiral of value creation. And by the way, it doesn't just take place in that walkable urban place. It takes place in what I refer to as the penumbra, again, high school science, the penumbra that the single family homes around the walkable urban place also go up in, in value. Um, my research at Brookings shows that, the, that in the penumbra, the sales per square foot premium is between 40 and 100% because you can live in suburban splendor and walk to great urbanism. It's the best of two worlds. I first learned this, I used to, um, work for a guy and then I bought the company, a company called Robert Charles Lesser and Company, and Bob Lesser lived in Beverly Hills, California. And he lived at a very famous intersection that you've never been to. It's the intersection in Beverly Hills of Gregory and Peck, where Gregory Peck got his name. And Bob lived in a single family home on a very small lot, 1920s Mediterranean beauty. And two blocks from him, was the intersection of Wilshire and Rodeo with phenomenally high-end specialty stores. Two blocks to the east was his local grocery store and local hardware store. He had the best of two worlds. And that's where I came, and yet he lived in this beautiful suburban place that had traffic calming, and only those that, that lived there or were visiting could, could in fact park on the streets. He was completely protected from the hubbub, but he lived in suburban splendor. However, and this is again something that Jim Rouse gave us, is that we have to be conscious of the affordability crisis. That with this pent up demand for walkable urban, which I don't think is gonna be satisfied for at least a generation, we only add 2% to the built environment in a good year, and we're not in good years right now. 
it's going to take us at least 30 years to catch up with the pent-up demand. That means that the pent-up demand and those price premiums are going to be around for decades to come. And we're going to have a significant affordable housing problem for our school teachers, for our policemen, for just everyday workmen that we need to make, these, to make our communities work. So I did a survey at Brookings a few years back looking at the walkable urban places in the top 30 metros in the country. One of the reasons I moved to Washington, I used to live in Santa Fe and moved there about six years ago now because I had realized that Washington was the model of how we're building the built environment. I know that sounds perverse, but Washington has more examples of walkable urban places than any place else in the country. So I did this survey and it turned out to be not just true, but wildly true, that Washington has more walkable urban places per capita than any place else in the country. It has over 20 of these places. And there's another 13 emerging. That contrasts to 20 years ago when they only had two, Georgetown and Old Town, Alexandria. Um, and then you can see the other towns that it's evolving in, where they have the most walkable urban places. All knowledge economy metro areas. What that means is that there's going to be four to seven walkable urban places per million of population if the Washington model is to be followed. Very surprising is that 65% of the walkable urban places in this survey of the top 30 metros in the country had rail transit. In Washington, it was 90%. The other thing that really surprised me is that, again, of the top 30 metros, 50% of these walkable urban places were in the center city, 50% were in the suburbs. In Washington, it was 70% were in the suburbs. So what that means is that there's going to be a demand for hundreds of new walkable urban places in this country. The question is, where will they go? So one of the things that we're beginning to learn is that many of them are going to go in the formerly drivable suburban places, like Columbia. And particularly if you're regionally significant, like Columbia wants to be, where you play a regionally significant role in the economy. This is not a local serving bedroom community. It's a regionally significant place. We're going to see more and more of these, what have been come, come to be known as edge cities, which is what Columbia has been, an edge city. It's going to evolve into a walkable urban place. Research also shows that there's five kinds of walkable urban places. There's the traditional downtown, and you've seen that in the Inner Harbor, of course. There's downtown adjacent places. These are my favorite. I live in DuPont Circle. That think, you know, that you've got the downtown and then all around the downtown are different uh, places that have different characters, somewhat lower densities, uh, but surrounding the downtown, like DuPont Circle, like the West End in DC, like Fells Point in Baltimore, like Mount Vernon in the Baltimore. That's a downtown adjacent place. But then the suburbs, because that's why we're here, we've got suburban town centers that were places built back in the 19th century, 18th century that have a grid of streets built before the car and that they've all come back throughout the country. I'm going to Pasadena tomorrow morning. I used to live in Pasadena when I was out there in Southern California and it was a dump. 30 years ago, now it is this incredibly lively, walkable urban place. Last time I was there three years ago, that very week, a Tiffany's opened up uh, in, in the downtown. But here we've got a suburban redevelopment model, and this is probably where more walkable urban places are going to show up. Built around the 10,000 dead or dying regional malls and strip malls in this country. This, the regional mall as a product type is dead. There will not be another one built in this country. There hasn't been one built in at least eight, maybe ten years in this country, and most of them are converting to high-density, walkable urban places. And then there's also suburban greenfields. These are going to be in the minority because they cost so much to build, but National Harbor is the most recent one in the region. So here's the Washington, D.C. metro area as far as where those walkable urban places are going. And so the, um, the darker green is the existing, the 23 existing. 
and you can see many of them are out in the suburbs. The, the uh, brighter uh, red are the emerging ones. And of course, you're up there in the upper right-hand corner. <coughs> but let me give you some examples of some, drivable, or of some walkable urban places that have evolved that you would know about. Obviously, downtown Bethesda, which is a, a suburban town center that's been redeveloped into a very exciting place. The upper left-hand corner, those twin towers, those office buildings that are renting at $50 a square foot, um, that 10 years ago, that was a Bob's Big Boy drive-in. You may remember it. Uh, Silver Spring is a remarkable place, something that you can learn a lot from. It's the most racially and income integrated place in the Washington, D.C. region. It's quite remarkable. And Discovery putting their corporate headquarters there is just a great, great thing. And the fact that the founder of Discovery went to Silver Spring High School tells you about the, about the importance of memory. Because he belongs in New York or out in Hollywood and studies in Silver Spring, Maryland. Arlington is the place that you all have to understand because Arlington is the best example and has the most examples of drivable suburban redevelopment. Wilson Boulevard, which goes through Boston and goes through Clarendon and goes through all the other places there, there in Arlington. 25 years ago, if you were to do a projection of what was going to happen along Wilson Boulevard, you'd say, well, these are all obsolete strip retail. It's going to become a slum. It's going nowhere, it's just going downhill. It's just going to be a corridor to get people into DC. Well, today it's added four times as much density along Wilson Corridor. Wilson Corridor is 10% of the land mass of Arlington. It now represents 55% of the tax base. And guess what's happened to the traffic counts on Wilson Boulevard? In absolute terms, four times the square footage it's gone down slightly because of the people that are walking to work from their high density apartments and condos, the people that are using the metro, uh, and the people that are wa working or f walking from their single family homes to their work. Here's Clarendon, another great example of a walkable urban place that was a strip mall that was falling apart. Here's a greenfield development. Um, doesn't, I mean, it somewhat applies to Columbia just because you've always been compared for 40 years to, uh, to a Reston, but Reston Town Center, which is in the, you can see the aerial view in the lower right-hand corner, is a small piece of Rockefeller Center. When it first was built by, ironically, Mobile Oil Company, they owned it 20 years ago, um, people fought it like mad. About 10 years ago, the then owners decided to put a big box store next to it, the same people that fought the high density fought the big box center because they wanted more high density. They wanted more walkable urbanism. The price premium in Reston Town Center for all product types, housing, hotel, office, you pay 60% more for, a, for uh, each square foot there than if you were a quarter mile, half mile away. People are willing to pay a lot more money to live in a walkable urban place. But there's other examples as well. Well, here's Dadeland, Florida, outside of Miami. Here is a, this is one of the largest, in fact, it's known as the uh, shopping center that serves South America. A lot of folks jet up to Miami and take a bus down to Dadeland uh, from, from South America. But they're turning all the surface parking lots into high density, walkable urban places surrounding the, the uh, mall. And then here's a great transformation out in Denver. This was the first regional mall in Denver. It was called Via Italia. The developer obviously went to Italy and decided that those little arches would make his place Italian. Um, it was a pretty classic suburban mall. By the early part of the last decade, it was dead. There's only one department store was, was alive. It was bulldozed except for that one department store. A grid of streets were put in, and this is it today. It, gets, it also gets a 60% price premium over all the competition and has put a, a property tax foundation under Lakewood, which was reliant upon residential property taxes. So some observations as I close. The good news 
is that there's pent up market demand for hundreds of regionally significant walkable urban places, which is what your plan calls for here in, in the town center, and thousands of local serving places like your villages. It'll be the driver of this economy. It'll put a foundation under our economy. Why we're at 2% and not at 3.5% growth rate in this country, and why uh, the working class in this country has a 20% unemployment rate is because the built environment is on the sideline and we're not producing places like Columbia Town Center. But it's not just about the redevelopment of our center cities. It's even more about the transformation of our suburbs. But it's going to take a fundamental redirection of our transportation policy. Remember, transportation drives development. We need to stop building new roads. We're going to have a hard enough time maintaining the roads we have, because they are in terrible condition in most parts of the country. So we have to fix it first as far as our roads and build the second half of the transportation system. Rail transit, and your governor is big time behind this. And biking, very important. But of course, at its base, it needs to be walkable. And what are we going to get? Going back to both energy consumption and greenhouse gas e emissions. Um, here on the left is a typical American drivable suburban household. It uses over 600,000 BTUs per year. A typical drivable suburban household. About 200 of that is heating the home and air conditioning the home, and the rest is for transportation. Look at to, to, to the right, though. If that same household moves into a green, walkable urban location, they're going to cut their energy consumption and they're going to cut their, their greenhouse gas emissions by 75%. Remember what I said before, over 70% of energy usage and greenhouse gas emissions come from the built environment. Somebody moves from a drivable uh, location to a walkable, you're going to cut that by 75%. That's the number one way we're going to get free of the Middle East. By the way, we have half of our defense budget is spent in the Middle East and protecting the oil lanes. That's $300 billion per year, not to mention the American lives that have been lost. And this is the way to gain energy independence and to address climate change. So nationally, what we need to do, the transportation bill is the next thing up. I'm doing a lot of work on the Hill with this. It's going to be a small bill in all probability, but that doesn't really matter. If, it's going to, if this is going to be the smallest transportation bill in real terms we've ever passed. Because if you haven't heard, we're broke. Um, uh, the White House would like a larger bill. They, they just have got to mention how we're going to pay for it. Um, but the key issue is that we, as a, you as a metropolitan area, particularly you in Columbia, need to take a look at how you want to grow and what kind of transportation system you should put in to get that growth. And your town plan does that. I'm also urging for the federal government to use the one thing we do have at the federal level, which is loan guarantees, credit enhancement. At least for now, the Chinese are willing to take our paper. I don't know how much longer that's going to last. And we also need an infrastructure bank where we can invest in critical infrastructure improvements, because our infrastructure is so poor in this country. We have been lapped by Europe, by China, and soon by India, of all places. But we also have to deal with the affordable housing, and I'm not going to go through this in detail, but there's a lot of solutions to dealing with the affordable housing problem. But the best solution is just to build more walkable urban. The reason for the price premiums is the shortage of supply. So what have you done right? Well. It's counterintuitive, but you've got the right location. That the location right in between Baltimore and Washington really made Columbia work. If Washington didn't exist, Columbia probably would have failed. Every master plan community that went on the other side of the metropolitan area from the favored quarter failed, with one other exception. You were one, the other exception was a small place south of Orlando 
known as Disney World and what else grew up around it. And it happened to get 55 million annual visitors, the largest tourist destination in the world. That's not going to be repeated anytime soon. Um, but you were bailed out by the fact that Washington also uh, uh, grew into you. You are the best in class, though, of the drivable suburban model. You did a very pretty version of sprawl. <laughs> but you've gone flat. Since the mid-'80s, this place has not changed. You've not evolved since then. You are implementing a 1960s Jim Rouse plan very well. He moved two levels be, uh, beyond you. Uh, and you know, he's been dead now for you know, almost, you know, almost 20 years. But he was beyond where Columbia is when he died. Your Columbia Association is remarkable. And it is a major asset that you have as a nonprofit organization that you, the people, control and that you pay into. And as you implement the Columbia Town Center Plan, you're going to see, just like, just like Arlington did, a huge increase in the fees going into the Columbia Association from the commercial side, from the town center. You've got you know, great community input into that town center process that is essential. And you've made the right thing easy to do. It's now legal and by right. And Jim Rouse's vision uh, seems to have been picked up by Howard Hughes as far as their vision. And it's really positive that while you don't have one owner here, you have one dominant owner here. It's a lot easier than having 3,000 owners like a lot of uh, walkable urban places have to really get a, a positive movement. And you've survived the Great Recession, thank goodness. But the only missing element is rail transit. You've got an over-reliance on the car. And you like it that way. And you're going to have to get over it. Until you can drop a, a car out of your household and shift your household spending, you're not going to be able to, part to really participate and build the household wealth that we need to do as a country and you do as a community, and certainly our young people need to do. And you're going to be building too much expensive decked parking. That's just going to be a waste of money. Each parking deck space costs twenty dollars to $25,000 to build. And then you give it away. That's not a great way to invest your assets. Bus rapid transit is a possible interim solution. But Americans don't like buses. They like rail transit. And it's going to need a dedicated right-of-way. That bus rapid transit is just a name if it doesn't have a dedicated right-of-way. That's the vast majority of, of, of the money for rail transit anyway. And it means you're going to have fewer lanes for your cars. But you've got plenty of lanes, and especially as you're going to be converting a lot of those trips to rail transit and biking. And the big question is, how do you pay for it? And the answer is, you're going to partly pay for it. The developer's going to partly pay for it. And you're not going to get as much from the state or the feds as you think you will. Get used to it. And um, there have been thousands of bond issues levied over the last seven years for rail transit in this country. In all of them calling for, for tax increases, 70% of them have passed because the country wants rail transit. So here's what White Flint has done. White Flint's a phenomenal model that you should take a look at to see how they've been doing it. That you know, what, you know, on the right is White Flint today. On the left is how they're going to share Rockville Pike to put rail transit in a dedicated right-of-way down the middle. And how do we pay for it? We learn from the past. A hundred years ago, this country had the finest rail transit system in the world. 80% of it was paid for by real estate developers to get their customers to their land. They subsidized the rail out of their land profits. That's why uh, real estate developers are willing to come to the table and talk about that. But it's not going to be enough. You're going to have to pony up as well. So this is what's going to happen, of course. This is just 
out of your official plan, and you're going to see the highest values in that center circle with the high density walkable urban, the most exciting places, that it's going to be a 24 7 place. That penumbra outside of the, the, that bigger circle is going to be more like DuPont Circle, high density walkable urban, but a little quieter, a little lower density. But those single family housing that's not going to be affected directly, it's going to be still there 20, 30 years from now, but their values are going to go up because, as I said, you're going to have the best of two worlds. You're going to be able to have suburban splendor, yet walk to great walkable urbanism. So that's the future. Take it and run. Thank you very much. Well, that was really, really great, Chris. So as we usually do, we now have a Q&A session, and we're going to go about 20 to 25 or so. And it's going to be Jane and I, and I and Barbara Nicholas from the Howard Hughes Corporation. And um, what and how we're going to do this is, as we normally do, we're going to alternate from, from you all asking the uh, questions out in the audience and the ones written on the cards. So if, if you've written anything down, you can just um, send it to the center aisles here. And Devron and Marlis, if you can come and collect the cards. And then we have two handheld mics. So if you do have a question that you'd like to ask yourself, if you would raise your hand. And we're gonna actually start the questions off with Jane. Good evening, my name is Jane Demner. I'm the Director of Community Planning for CA and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, while you're getting your questions written or uh, thinking about what you'd like to say, I'll pose a first question uh, to Chris just to get the ball rolling. But we really do hope uh, to take your questions um, from throughout the audience. So um, we've spent a, a long time in the community discussing and debating the downtown plan and now that's adopted and so forth. Um, uh, what would happen if nothing changed as we went forward? You know, we're waiting for things to, to start as the economy starts uh, maybe on the uptick, but what happens if nothing changes for Columbia? Your values drip down, uh, basically drift down. You're going to become increasingly obsolete. Again, keep in mind there's 37 million overproduced large lot single family homes in this country. I wrote an article in The Atlantic two years ago called The Next Slum. And where we're seeing slums evolve in our country, many times in homes that are five and 10 years old, are on the drivable suburban fringe. And their values have dropped below replacement values. When your market value is lower than replacement value, it means that you cannot justify putting another dollar into your house. If your roof needs replacement, you patch it. You keep the same old kitchen for 30, 40 years. That's the definition of a slum. And we're seeing that emerge in many recently developed drivable suburban fringe communities. And the best way, by far, to bring up single family values is to have the best of both worlds, where you live in great suburban uh, splendor if you so choose, yet can walk or very quickly get to a high density walkable urban place. Now it's very important, and I, and you know, again, you've got the management organization here, to make sure that the unintended consequences of great walkable urbanism doesn't spill over into the neighborhoods, and that can be done. This is not rocket science. You don't have to have graduated from NSA to figure this out. That um, that we know how to manage that. Again, Bob Lesser's community in Beverly Hills with traffic calming and parking stickers found a way that the impacts were quite limited on the surrounding communities. So as long as you've got the management in place, those neighborhoods are gonna, again, the research shows it's a 40 to 100% price premium on a price per square foot basis if you live in that best of two worlds. Okay, so um, I've got a whole slew of questions here. So we're going to start with a question here, and then we're going to go to the audience. So again, if you would raise your hand, and then someone will have a mic there. And, and if you're asking a question from the audience, if, 
if you can have it be a question and not a statement and as short and concise as possible. Okay, the first one here. How can Columbia be made walkable when the retail areas have no sidewalks? Put in sidewalks. <laughs> That's what I thought the answer was. Very simple. But there is that. The town center, now again, I know enough just to be dangerous, but looking at the plan that, that you've adopted, you've put in a grid of streets into the surface parking lots. This, by the way, is something that the regional mall owners of this country have fought so hard for so many years. I've been beating up against them for 20 years to take that 80% of their land mass, which is under asphalt, and put in streets and high-density walkable urban. Now, you know, it's harder said than done because the anchor stores control their own parking fields. But you've put in place this buy-right plan that, that, that puts in this grid of streets. That's why a place like Bethesda and Silver Spring, which had a grid of streets because they were developed before the car, really have an advantage over you. Because you've got to put in that infrastructure that they had based upon their great grandfathers and, and um, you know, the early 20th century. Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, we have a hand here. And one over here, Devron. Are you right there? Okay. Um, Cindy Coyle. Um, I'm on the CA board, just to Good. let you know. Um, really loved your briefing, and um, I was, we were told not to say anything about make conversation or whatever, but I want to say that I just came back from San Francisco, which I think really should be number one on your list. <laughs> And, it's the metropolitan area, right. not the city. But I, but I honestly do think that our biggest weakness is mass transportation. What I'm asking you is, did you see our transportation plan? Mm -hmm. Did you see anywhere on the transportation plan a rail system? No. Nope. Is that a weakness in our plan? Yes. Thank you. Now, with regard to... By the way, rail transit is the most important transportation infrastructure of the early 21st century. It's as important as putting the freeways in in the late 20th century. I, I cannot agree more and think that if we do not have a plan that includes rail, the whole thing goes up in smoke, in my opinion. The second... The and, and, and by the way, the issue, you know, you don't have... You can build transit-ready places that then attract rail. Reston Town Center is that example. Reston Town Center has been up for 20, over 20 years, and now, you know, by five years from now, they'll get rail. So the, it's transit-oriented and transit-ready. So the other thing is, I hear you and say, well, you're going to have to be a mess before anybody's going to, but I think the plan has to indicate where that's going to be, otherwise you're going to build over the land that could potentially have been used for rail. So mm -hmm. my feeling is that has got to be dealt with. The second thing is, is that the state legislature has not in any way acted or behaved in a way that will make us believe that we are going to potentially get money for rail. As a matter of fact, the Columbia Association has asked in informal ways to the state what kinds of hope we have to potentially get connected to rail. And we're being told, forget it, it's never gonna happen, you're never gonna see it. So what I wanna know from you is, what advice do you have for us as a community to push this issue? Because I'm in agreement with you, it is great, we want it. Tell us how to get it. First off, build a transit-ready place that, as I say, becomes a magnet, just like Reston Town, uh, a town Center did. And so, and quite honestly, National Harbor is following that same model. They have planned in rail transit, and I, I'm, I'm a colleague and old friend of uh, Paris Glendening, and I was with him yesterday, and he was just talking about how proud he was of the Wilson Bridge, of the of the mass transit line that was built into the Wilson Bridge at great cost, and National Harbor has built into their plans the right-of-way to bring it into National Harbor. So it, you know, it's, it's the green line from Branch Avenue going into, going into Alexandria. Um, so yes, you've got to get that right-of-way planned. 
it's probably, I'm guessing, I mean, I'm not a transportation planner, but my guess is, is that you've got these ginormous right-of-ways already that could, they could go right down the center, and again, you're going to lose a lane on each side, but you're going to gain a whole lot of transportation options and maybe, as I say, get rid of a car out of your household as a result, which will build your household wealth. Um, the other th big question, though, is how do you fit into the system? And are you on a loop from the commuter rail that's just to the east of you? So is it a streetcar? Is it an extension of, of, uh, of a metro, which is possible? Um, is it some, some other Baltimore-Washington uh, connection? So those questions are important, but don't just stop and say, oh, no, we can't do anything until we get that absolutely resolved. But because building great places, you have to go down 14 different paths at once. It's important to knit it all together. But I would urge you. But again, as I mentioned earlier, you're going to help pay for it. The developer is going to help pay for it. I mean, I'm not volunteering for him. <laughs> He's probably going to beat me up afterwards. But um, that, that what we've seen in every other metropolitan area that's gone forward is they basically raised their sales tax. And the one that uh, is the largest is Los Angeles, where I'll be tomorrow. They passed Measure R, one and a half cent sales tax, $40 billion over 30 years to build out the rail transit system in Southern California. Uh, and they've already done a, a remarkable job over the last 20 years. They're going to triple it over the next 20. But St. Louis, St. Louis of all places, they passed a half cent sales tax. They're building out their light rail system. They passed it 18 months ago in the middle of the recession, in the middle of the fiscal crisis. And their, their voters, by 62%, said, we've got to have light rail. So if you want to invest in your future, you better th start thinking about taxing yourself to be part of that. I'll take one from the cards now. Um, uh, how do you integrate an existing regional mall into a walkable urban as environment? Good question. Um, we're learning. This is not something that there's a textbook out there that we can just point to and say, this is how you do it. I showed you one example out in Denver that they tore it down and started from scratch. And that's quite viable. Um, there's the other example down at the Dadeland Mall where they built up to, they're building up to it in the surface parking lots and maintaining the mall. Um, my own thinking is, is that eventually most malls will open up and that they will put a pedestrian street down the middle, the old hallway, um, and, but maybe they might even put cars down there and have a little teaser parking there as well. Um, and so there'll be a lot of different ways, but it'll be open air. And even if it isn't still enclosed, which I doubt, um, that you'll have it built right up to the edges and there'll be streets all around it and those, those blank walls will start facing outward instead of inward. Okay, a, a question right in the back there. You mentioned that Columbia has succeeded where other plant communities didn't and it seems to me that the reason for that is our fundamental attention to values and not just property values but social values. Yes. And yet the biggest metric you've given us is price per square foot, which says to me what the rich are willing to pay for, which ignores those other social values. Can you help us square this circle or, or respond to this? I mean, you mentioned, yes, we have to have a good affordable housing plan, but I don't see one likely to happen, and the money is not going to be there for it. What I, I put up 14 different bullet points of affordable housing uh, tactics that can be employed. Um, I was involved with the redevelopment of downtown Albuquerque when I lived in Santa Fe, and we put in place a mechanism where they, as the gentrification took off in downtown Albuquerque, a thing that I set up and a bunch of us set up called, uh, called, called the Albuquerque Civic Trust. And I really learned from that. Uh, I mean, this is basically Jim Rouse 201, that we gave ownership in all the projects I owned, I had a ownership in, 
we gave 15, 20% ownership in all of our deals. So that as the gentrification took place, 15, 20% of that would get recycled into affordable housing. And it would be a perpetual revolving fund. So as you know, that money would be invested in affordable housing, it would then be paid back from the affordable housing and continue to recycle. Um, again, Jim Rouse 201. And, but there's 13 other ideas. Many of them don't take money. Things such as inclusionary zoning. Howard County should have an inclusionary zoning law, if it doesn't, like Montgomery County, where for every five units built, one needs to be affordable. What that does is that it just reduces property value silently. And so, you know, Montgomery County hasn't suffered by building those 26,000 affordable housing units that they've built permanently in Montgomery County. Another thing is allowing granny flats, auxiliary housing, all throughout Columbia. That it's my guess in this country, and it's a guess that can't be proven so I can make this number up, um, <laughs> that there's at least 100, maybe 150 million surplus bedrooms in this country as our kids have all flown the coop. And they're just sitting there being heated, being chilled, but not being used because there's no secondary way of getting in. And if we would allow for the school teachers to live in those basement flats, in those uh, flats over the garage, we'll be able to mix income into our neighborhoods just like we did 50, 75 years ago. My second grade school teacher lived a block from my house, and I, and I found this out because she came out of this little English basement walking to school one day, and I was, it just hit me, oh my lord, she lives in my neighborhood. Because she was renting a place, I didn't know it then, she was renting a place from somebody down the street. So we need a conscious, affordable housing strategy because we can't build golden ghettos. I'm, I'm doing something at Brookings right now. I am crafting a performance metric system for walkable urban places. One metric is economic. One metric is social equity. And it's going to, on a lead-like ranking system, say how well you're doing. And what I'm hoping, once the research is done, come the end of the summer, is begin to correlate how important is it economically to have a socially just place. We don't know the answer yet. I hope the answer is that it makes a great deal of economic sense to have a mixed income, walkable urban place, but we don't know that answer yet. So Chris, I think we'd all be very interested in seeing what the results of your I research are. So how do we get that? Is it on your website or can you send It'll, it to someone? Or? Well, again, it's not done yet. We're yeah, still collecting okay. data and, um, but you know, It'll be uh, published by Brookings. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be a chapter in my next book. Um, buy the book. <laughs> my nonprofit pro publisher, Island Press, would love you to buy a book. I will never see a dime from it, but All right. they it, will. It sounds great. So an interesting question here. How do we reuse the houses from which people would move to these walkable urban communities? That's a tough question um, because the millennials ain't buying your houses. That's why there's 37 million surplus houses out there, large lot, single family. And um, so the way the market deals with it is by lowering the price. So if you think that you're retiring off your house, you might want to recalculate uh, or sell quickly. Um, but again, the best way is to have it be close to a walkable urban place. That's by far the best way because that's an anchor that sort of radiates out financial support, economic support to those neighborhoods. Um, the, um, um, a lot of them are just, I mean, the poor will always be among us and it's going to be where, it's gonna be a hand-me-down kind of housing for folks that can't afford to live in higher density walkable urban places. Um, we're past time, but if you're okay, can we take sure. some more? Okay, terrific. Let's take one from the audience. Okay. Person right in the middle had, I think it's... Some... Oh, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Trevor Green. Um, you mentioned a lot about the residential and 
You mentioned a lot about the residential and commercial aspects of walkable urbanism. I was wondering if you could address um, what aspects would help make walkable urbanism successful in regards to cultural, mm -hmm. um, educational, recreational amenities. Right. Regionally significant places, and I didn't spend a whole lot of time on this, but you know, there's regionally significant places like you're proposing with your town center, then there's local serving places like your nine villages. And they fulfill fundamentally different functions in the built environment. With regionally significant places, having cultural concentrations, particularly one of a kind cultural concentrations, focus there is very important, not just for the vitality, but they perform better. And sports facilities, particularly professional sports facilities, belong in walkable urban places, particularly baseball, arenas, not football. And I played football, and I like football, but it's worthless as far as walkable urban. Um, what you did, and in fact, we, we all learned this lesson from Janet Marie Smith, Bart Harvey's wife, when she was in charge of Camden Yards. It was the most important baseball stadium of the last 50 years. That, that she shoehorned in Camden Yards into downtown. She did build some parking, but we now later, we've later learned you don't need to build parking if you put it into downtown, because you can double use the office parking that is not used at night and on weekends. Same with arenas. So, Putting these cultural sports uses there is critical. The other thing is eds and meds, particularly higher ed. Higher education, um, again, the kids want this. The millennials want this. And if you take a look at NYU, of course, Penn. Penn was the one that started this back in the 90s when Judy Roden was president. She pioneered an urban university embracing its community. And NYU and Columbia, and you know, colleges and universities throughout the country. I was just out in Phoenix. And ASU, there's a new light rail line that just opened up connecting Tempe and downtown Phoenix. And if you know downtown Phoenix, it ain't much. This light rail line comes. They've now put 5,000 beds downtown for students. They have 12,000 students uh, that are in classes there. The nursing school's there. The medical school's there. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism is there. It's going to be where ASU is going to grow because Michael Crow, the president, said the kids want it. They want urbanism. So all these urban schools that used to be really lowly ranked have all risen through the ranks as far as US News and World Report. So they belong in a walkable urban place. So there's lots of great civic functions that belong in these walkable urban places. It's not just a monoculture. One here, um, by the way, you just hit two or three in here, so that was very good. Um, in terms of mixed use or transit oriented development or redevelopment, what, in your experience, are the largest obstacles for the lenders for such projects? The lenders, this blows every circuit the lenders have. <laughs> that most lenders, like most developers, grow, they grow up in silos and they know how to do walk-up rental apartments, and they've done thousands of walk-up rental apartments, or they've done strip retail, and they've done you know, hundreds of strip retail uh, uh, developments. And then you come in and you put retail on the ground floor and apartments up above, and every circuit they have gets zapped. Um, so it's very difficult. For, I mean, they, they too have to become jet pilots. So it's gonna take time. And lenders, obviously, since we in real estate managed to lose them a lot of money over the last five and 10 years, um, they're a little conservative. Okay, uh, one more from the floor. Oh, okay, right back here. Sorry, Ron. And that will probably put us at time. Hi, um, it seems to me if you wanna keep people off the roads, a good, piece of infrastructure is the internet, um, mm -hmm. and uh, people are going to school, going to work, going to museums, going to movies, socializing, community organizing, politics, all on the internet. What about that? If you spend your entire day looking at a screen like most of us now do, the last thing you want to do at the end of the day is go home and look at a screen. No matter you know, where you are, your body has to be someplace. And uh, most people we're finding 
you know, if on the internet nobody knows that you're a dog, but at night you want to be involved with people. This is a little different than the industrial age where you were in forced conformity, bending metal, uh, and what you wanted to do was to go home to a nice, peaceful, quiet, suburban splendor. Um, if you're spending your entire day focused on, on a screen, uh, and that's how you make your living, uh, walkable urbanism is even more important to you. So, um, uh, you know, you, you got to live someplace. And right now, the young people, particularly the creative class, I mean, the, there's some pretty good research that, uh, of course, uh, Richard Florida has done, talking about the creative class and what they're demanding. The other thing about the creative class and the knowledge economy is that it's with personal connections that deals happen. That, and you don't meet people very readily or certainly you don't communicate except with your middle finger when you're driving. So, you know, people want this. I mean, we're social beings and the knowledge economy depends upon those connectivities uh, to make the kind of creativity that the knowledge economy drives on. So, with that, I want to thank you all for coming out. And uh, Howard Hughes would like to thank the Columbia Association for reaching out to us and asking us to co-host this great evening. And we would like to thank Chris for joining us. I, I think you've given us a lot to think about and um, a lot of really good data. So thank you, and good, good night.